no and vault to high yield. This is actually my very first video and my goal of this whole channel is to cover topics in tech that are interesting to me personally, which is why I will focus on the silicon behind technology and talk about my thoughts on developments in chip design, manufacturing and everything silicon in general. And if there's other stuff in tech, I might talk about that too. But now let's get on with the topic of this video, the Valve Steam Deck, and more specifically the silicon behind it. Why I think Valve chose this specific AMD APU for their handheld console, or rather handheld PC, and why such an APU design makes a lot of sense. When I saw the Steam Deck announcement, the first thing I did was to check the hardware specs, and to my surprise, or rather not to my surprise but to my excitement, the specs looked a lot like what has been rumored to be an AMD APU called Van Gogh. I've read a lot of rumors about Van Gogh before, but the most detailed information uh, that I saw so far came from a YouTuber called Moore's Law is Dead back in April of this year. I remember this video very well because the whole topic was really interesting to me. Um, I'm gonna put on a screenshot of this video and I'm gonna link the whole video down in the description and I can recommend that you go and check out his video and his whole channel in general. So um, back when I first heard about Van Gogh, my initial thought was, why does AMD combine their CPU and GPU IPs in such interesting ways. Like, why have a Zen 3 plus Vega APU and a Zen 2 plus RDNA 2 based APU? Why not create a check of all trades, so to speak, and combine their most modern CPU and GPU technologies into one amazing APU? And after thinking about this for a while, the reasons for these design decisions make a lot of sense to me. Of course, you could try to design the most powerful APU possible, combining a lot of high-speed CPU cores of the latest IP, which would be Zen 3, and a lot of compute units of the latest GPU IP, which would be RDNA 2 in this case. But that's a goal already met when you're combining high-end CPUs with a discrete high-end GPU. Yeah, we're talking about the different dimensions here, both in actual size and in power, um, but combining the best of both worlds, it's, it's a norm. That's not the design goal of an APU, if you think about it. APUs are, at their base, a be-all-do-all solution, but if you look closer, they've always have had a specific focus. The initial idea behind this concept was to add a lower spec integrated GPU into a CPU so all those consumers who did not need a lot of GPU power besides the basics of running a simple display and maybe helping with some video coding playback, they could just get a single APU and avoid adding a discrete GPU into the system because a discrete GPU adds extra costs it takes physical space, it adds extra power, and you, if you don't need that, you want to avoid that. Before APUs appeared in the market, um, we had sometimes um, iGPUs integrated in motherboards. I remember back in the day you could buy motherboards with different iGPUs and for specific sockets. Um, so the APU was just the next step in the evolution. In this initial idea, the focus is on the CPU. And the GPU, while not an afterthought, is just a sidekick. It's there to help and cover the most basic functions, so the computer can actually run. But then again, why doesn't AMD just add the most modern GPU IP into all their APUs? RDNA is more modern than Vega, why offer Zen 3 plus Vega APUs in the first place, like the Ryzen 7 5700G? There are a couple of reasons for this. It has to do with space. 
that equals die size with development costs with engineering decisions and I think it makes a lot of sense. Vega is a highly optimized IP especially when it comes to its implementation into APUs. AMD can pack those Vega compute units very dense so they don't take a lot of space. The AMD engineers have a lot of experience implementing Vega into APUs. The building blocks already exist. And the greatest weaknesses of Vega, especially when you think about Vega's discrete desktop GPU appearances, like Vega 56, 64, or Radium 7, the greatest weaknesses are basically disarmed when Vega is implemented on an APU level. Let me try to explain. You might think of Vega as a power-hungry architecture, but that's only the case well outside of its sweet spots concerning compute unit size, compute unit amount, clock speed. And it goes hand in hand with the process node too. The version of Vega that's used on AMD's latest APUs, like the Ryzen 7 5700G, is a very efficient implementation, so much that it's not really clear if RDNA 2 at this level would offer any significant advantages in power consumption. The second issue that Vega was plagued with when you look at the desktop variants and graphics core next in general is CU utilization. Vega based discrete GPUs always had issues to fully saturate the compute units, basically to bring all their available power into play. But with only 8 compute units on a design like the 5700G, this also isn't a problem for the scheduler in the Vega-based APU. And most importantly, AMD already has the building blocks for an 8 compute unit Vega iGPU in their back pocket. They only need to implement it, and they have experience with implementing it. It's a very space-efficient design, and when you look at the APU from an engineering perspective and also from a cost perspective, it would be a failure if you concentrated your engineering efforts on the GPU part when the focus is actually CPU performance. In a nutshell, Vega's APU implementations are a lot better than you think if you compare them to the desktop counterparts because they avoid a lot of the issues that Vega had in a desktop space and they're a lot more efficient than their desktop counterparts due to avoiding these issues and the optimized process they're built on. Plus, the implementation of Vega in the current APUs is actually more advanced than the Vega architecture we've seen in the desktop in the past. On an APU that focuses on CPU performance, there is just no reason to go out of your way to implement a new RDNA 2 based IP into the GPU. The design will probably take longer, the compute units will use more space resulting in a large die size and more production costs, plus the yield will probably be lower and nobody wants that. And you very likely won't gain a lot, if anything, regarding power consumption. The best course of action is to take the powerful 8-core Zen 3 CCX and slap on the tried and tested 8-compute unit Vega. Now looking at Valve's Steam Deck, and the Van Gogh APU design, we can see the exact opposite. This APU uses the latest and greatest RDNA 2 GPU IP, but relies on older Zen 2 cores for the CPU. And as with the Zen 3 and Vega based 5700G, it makes a lot of sense in this case too. The focus is clearly on the GPU side of the APU. Valve wants a modern and up-to-date IP and enough GPU horsepower for modern gaming at 720p or 800p. And while I'm sure there are more than enough performance benefits using RDNA over Vega here, I think the biggest part is just getting a modern IP in line with current PCs and next-gen consoles like the PS5. We can see this focus also in the memory interface from Van Gogh because it's using low power DDR5. We don't know exactly how it's implemented. I am hoping for a 128-bit interface, but we can see a focus on bandwidth. A CPU primarily benefits from low latency. 
That's why we use low latency DDR memory for CPU bound system memory. And discrete GPUs, or GPUs in general, usually run with bandwidth focused GDDR. Using GDDR memory for combined system memory would be a bad choice though, but trying to get high bandwidth DDR is clearly focused on the GPU performance. Most modern integrated GPUs are bandwidth star starved. That's why getting fast RAM, especially higher clock RAM, has a big impact on GPU performance. And while a CPU also benefits from more bandwidth, it's more the latency that's to the CPU's taste. So Van Gogh has this top of the line RDNA2 GPU with fast and high bandwidth, low power DDR5. That's amazing. But why not combine it with the most up-to-date CPU IP, which would be Zen 3? It's for the same reasons the 5700G still uses Vega, because it makes sense from an engineering point of view, optimizing for space and implementation time, and because the main drawback, so to speak, of Zen 2 does not come into play in this configuration. First and foremost, as far as we know, there isn't even a 4-core Zen 3 CCX design to begin with. Of course, you could have used an 8-core Zen 3 design in combination with the 8CU RDNA2 GPU, but that would greatly increase the die size. Not only would you have twice as many cores, per core Zen 3 is also bigger. So the die size would really blow up, the yields would be worse, production costs would increase, other things you do not want. And spending the time and money to create a 4-core Zen 3 CCX from scratch would be a huge waste of those resources, especially since no one expects the Van Gogh in the Steam Deck would reach the same numbers of sales as a Switch or a PS5 and Xbox. It's just not feasible to spend this many resources on a 4-core Zen 3 CCX design especially since the main drawback of the Zen 2 architecture, the CCX to CCX communication via Infinity Fabric, is also not an issue when it comes to a single 4-core Zen 2 design implementation, as there is no other CCX to communicate with using the slow and power-hungry Infinity Fabric. It's the same reason the Ryzen 3 3300X was so popular and fast. AMD already has the building blocks for a 4-core Zen 2 design in its back pocket. It's easy to implement, it's tried and tested, the engineers know it in and out, it's space efficient, it doesn't have the cross CCX issues of the higher core count Zen 2 designs. Basically, it just works. In conclusion, using Zen 3 here would take a lot more engineering and manufacturing resources, and that would be in no way justifiable for the expected performance returns when going with a Zen 3 design. I think Van Gogh and the Stream Deck are both really interesting products. Van Gogh's design make, uh, makes a lot of sense when you think about the engineering goals and the manufacturing process. For me, the base version is the most exciting one because it's actually really cheap when you consider what you get for it. I tried to build a similar system here in Germany and not considering the form factor of course it's not possible to get such strong hardware for this price. Yes, you would probably get a large SSD but you also lose out on performance in the CPU and GPU department and on top of this you don't get the screen, the hardware, all the amenities and the ability for a portable design. I think the Steam Deck is a very cool piece of hardware with a lot of potential and an even more interesting APU design philosophy behind it. That's it for my first video on this channel. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope there will be a next video sometime soon.